Happy Mother's Day. We are going to be looking this morning for our Mother's Day message at Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. So Ruth chapter 1, verse 1 through 13. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons. And they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Then both Malan and Chilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. For she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people in giving them food. So she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I not yet sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons. Would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we look into your word on this Mother's Day, I pray that you would help me to have a clarity of mind and expression. Help us as we listen to uh, have our hearts undistracted and, so, and to really um, not just hear the word, but to apply it to our hearts and lives. Lord, I pray that this message will be a, an encouragement to our mothers and a challenge to all of us as we consider the truths that are here. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought of, uh, about God's word as being the ultimate no-spin zone? Take, for example, the title of my message, What Does a Godly Mother Look Like? Ask a large group that question, you're going to get a lot of different answers, and most of those answers will be um, answers that are based on their mom, or their perspective, or um, what they have seen in the examples that have been set before him. You'll also see a lot of the blood is thicker than water principle. Basically, your answer will largely be affected by what you've seen or haven't seen in your mom. And when you consider Mother's Day, or if you're talking about a mom on Mother's Day, er then everyone's mother is godly, or so you would think. But the Bible doesn't spin anything. God's truth is objective. It's never subjective. And what a godly mother is will not be dependent on anyone's emotional attachment to their human mom, which on a day like today will emphasize the good and while overlooking perhaps a lot of what isn't so good. So let's answer the question by looking at some godly moms in the Bible. Now, even before we start, we need to settle one thing. No human being is perfect, and so no godly mother in the Bible is going to be perfect either. So the hard part in really identifying who is or who isn't a good example of motherhood and what times and events during the biblical accounts of their lives shows us this is somewhat of a challenge. For example, is Sarah or was Sarah Abraham's wife a godly mother? Well, it depends on where in her life you're talking about, or it depends on how you evaluate that uh, based on what you're thinking about. 
Was she godly when she encouraged Abraham to take Hagar, her mistress, and to go into, in, in unto her in a, in a sexual way because she didn't have the faith and, and Abraham didn't have the faith that God was going to fulfill his promise to give him a son through, through them in the normal way? No, she wasn't godly during that time. But does that exempt her from being a godly mother? What about Rahab the harlot? Now you might say, well, there's a stretch, right? How could she be considered a godly mother? Was she even a mother? Well, yes, she was. Matter of fact, she's a very important one, considering that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5, she's described as being the mother of Boaz, who is the one who marries Ruth, in our text here in Ruth chapter 1. And all of these individuals end up in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Not only that, Sarah and Rahab, the harlot, are the only two women that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 by name in what we commonly refer to as God's Hall of Faith, a chapter that is dedicated to especially faithful people in biblical times. So mothers take comfort. You don't have to be perfect to be a godly mother, and you don't have to allow your past to keep you from being pleasing to God both now and in the future. In short, it's never too late to be a godly mother, as it's never too late to be a godly father or a godly child. But it sure is better to start when you're young. And I share all this to make a point. God's Word is the way in which we learn without any prejudice or without our personal spin being involved. Who has provided us with an example you can follow? Whether you're trying to be a godly mother or godly father or a godly single person, or a godly son or daughter, God is the one who we need to be striving to please. I mean, let's face it, you could be half the wife and mother that God wants you to be and still be highly thought of by your own family. You can be, in some cases, an unruly child and have a father or mother that talks about you as if you're a wonderful person. For example, my mom loves me and she thinks the world of me and I'd have to work really, really hard for her to think differently. But the reality is I want my life to measure up to God's expectations, to God's judgment. And that standard is going to be the only one that is accurate, the only one that is completely objective, and thus a lot harder than being wonderful in my mom's eyes. So as we celebrate our moms, let's look at a lesser-known biblical mom who the scripture portrays as a very good example of what a godly mother looks like. And just to mix it up, we're not even going to talk about Abraham or Sarah, the ones that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. We want to look at Naomi. And so as we turn to the book of Ruth, um, we wanted to learn this lesson from Naomi. A godly mother responds to the challenges of life with godly wisdom and triumphant faith. A godly mother responds to the challenges of life with godly wisdom and triumphant faith. Let's consider the challenges of Naomi's, of Naomi's life, which really, verses 1 through 13, what I've just read to you is really the focus. When we read these verses, you must... You, you, you can't help but come away with reading the events of verses 1 through 13 and, and thinking, wow, you think it's, a God, it's hard to be a godly mother in the 21st century? Do you think it's hard to be a godly mother during a pandemic? Well, how many of us right now are going hungry and needing to move? How easy it is to make excuses or to rationalize not being all that God wants us to be by thinking, well, it's a lot harder now. We live in a very complex society. Well, let's see how hard it was for Naomi. First of all, consider the spiritual culture of her day. The Bible tells us in verse 1 that these events took place in the times when the judges ruled, or with the times when the judges governed. And so we need to understand what kind of times those were. First of all, the people of Israel. All you really need to know about this time is summed up in the last verse of the book of Judges, which is only one page over in your Bible for most of you, and that is Judges 21-25 that tells us that in those days, okay, these are the days of the Judges, this is the end of the book of Judges, in those days there was no king in Israel, everyone did that which was right 
in their own eyes. Sound familiar? It's kind of like our society today, is it? isn't it? And yet that's the way it was in the times of the judges. And because of that, God brought a punishment upon them. And we read about that here in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Now there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. There was a famine in the land. The whole reason why Naomi and her husband moved to Moab was because there was no food in Bethlehem and Israel. The famine had made it very, very difficult to live. Now, why do I call this famine a punishment from God? Notice the connection that I've already brought out that was made in this first verse. In the days when the judges ruled, which we know to be a very spiritually dark time in Israel, there was a famine in the land. God had made it very clear in his law that as Israel rejected God, that these kinds of judgments would come. Listen as I read Deuteronomy 32, verses 18 through 20, and then verse 23 in the first part of verse 24. It says, You are mindful of the rock that bore you, and you are unmindful, excuse me, of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom is no faithfulness. And I will heap disasters upon them. I will spend my arrows on them. They shall be wasted with hunger and devoured by plague and poisonous pestilence. You know, in the Bible, you almost never see a vicious storm or a famine or something that, that is not clearly identified in Scripture as being part of a judgment of God. In our modern day, we hesitate to say that because we don't have any kind of authoritative word from God that is, that is linking, for example, the pandemic that we're going to with a judgment from God. And if pastors say that, they, get, they just get killed by the press and by others who, who think that's ridiculous. But the fact of the matter is, God clearly judges nations and peoples with storms and famines and pestilences. When you look at the world today, and you look at the wickedness of the world, that every man is doing right, that which is right in his own eyes, that we have completely thrown off as a society God's word and the morality of God's word, can there be any doubt that what we're going through today is at least in part from the, from the perspective of God a judgment? A desire to awaken us, a desire to for us to see us turn back to him and trust in him and align ourselves with his word. We live in a society that gross immorality is praised, and the fear of God doesn't seem to exist. And that's the kind of day it was in Judges. In the book of Judges and here in Ruth chapter 1, we don't know exactly what specific time period during the times of the Judges that Naomi and Elimelech lived and eventually Ruth. But um, notice what we read in Judges 6, 1 through 6. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents and they would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels would not be count, could not be counted, so that they laid waste the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. The Midianites would devastate the land. They basically would completely destroy the crops and, and basically create a, a barren wasteland. 
fits in perfectly with the time when Naomi and her husband might have left Bethlehem to find food because there was no food in Israel. They could live a better life, they thought, down in Moab. But what does this have to do with being a godly mother? Well, again, the point is this. You think it's tough to raise godly children today and be a godly mother in our day? We don't really have anything compared that can hold a candle to Naomi's day. Being a godly mother was difficult in Naomi's day because of the spiritual culture of the day that then brought a, upon them this terrible famine and then also notice their personal family situation. Some people have difficult family situations. Well, Naomi certainly got herself into a difficult family situation because notice her and her husband's decision in verse 1 and 2. They decided to go to sojourn in verse 1 and with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech and the name of the wife Naomi and the names of their two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. And they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Well, it doesn't get any better for them as they do this because Scripture's being very gracious at this point. It doesn't record the, the conversations between the husband and the wife. But it shows us very something very significant about Naomi's character. They were making a bad decision. I'll show you that in the Scripture very clearly that Moving to Moab, while it looked like a very practical and wise decision because of the famine, it was not a wise decision because notice verse 2. They entered the land of Moab and they remained there. And verse 4 tells us that they remained there for 10 years. Now, what we don't find here is Naomi ever arguing with her husband about this in regards to being a, a good decision. But it's clear as you get to later in the passage when Naomi decided after her husband's death to move back to Bethlehem, that it kind of makes you wonder, and this is a little bit of conjecture on my part, but it kind of makes you wonder if she knew deep down that was always the wrong thing to do. But she submitted to her husband, and she moved down there. But what we do know is that created an incredible challenge for any godly family and any godly wife as her husband dies, she's left a widow with two sons, and she's living in a place that God calls a wash basin in Psalm 60, verse 7 through 8. The Moabites were heathen people. They were people who God clearly taught the Israelites that they were not to have close relationships with them. None of the heathen nations, the Israelites were not to intermarry with them. And yet here we see that happening as Elimelech, his sons, Malon and Chilion, marry Moabite women. So as we consider what it means to be a godly woman and we try to demonstrate that Naomi, who ends up being very godly as she grows in her spiritual walk through this situation. And yet she was living in a very difficult culture at a diff very difficult time. This continues to be seen when we notice her entire family's demise. We've already kind of started slipping into this. But in verse 5, it says, Both Malon and Chilion also died. And the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. In verse 13, she describes this entire situation and where she is in life by saying this, For the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Now, why would she say that? Well, she's lost everything. And in the process of time, she has only two Moabite daughters-in-law. And this is not a good situation for any of them. Because as she eventually goes to return to the land, um, she has these Moabite daughters-in-law who, who's going to want to marry them? What Israelite's going to want to marry them? And so she says that the hand of the Lord is against them. When she finally does return, as we see at the end of the chapter, notice what she says there. So they both went 
until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? They could hardly recognize her. She said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? She went out full, she says, but she's come back empty. She has no husband. Both of her sons are dead. And Ruth, only one of her two daughters-in-law, have returned with her. And she sees that as a problem for Ruth because as she says at the end of the passage here in verse 12 and 13, don't stay with me because if you stay with me, there's no hope. There's no hope for you to have a, to have a family. Before we get there or go any further with that, we certainly just want to stop and make this application. You can be a godly mother, a godly wife, even if your family situation isn't perfect. Naomi's family situation was far from perfect. I would venture to say her situation was much worse than many of you that are listening to this message. And yet we often find ourselves struggling to justify where we're at spiritually because of a past or because of circumstances that are not what we would want them to be. But a godly mother responds to the challenges of life with godly wisdom and triumphant faith. It's not what happens to you that determines or shapes your character. It's how you respond to it. So let's notice how Naomi responded to these seemingly insurmountable obstacles to obedience and faith. Talk about someone who had to live by faith and not by sight. Everything in her life at this point is about as dark and dreary as it could be. No one but God could have seen what he was going to do for her as a result of her godly decisions. Well, we start seeing these godly decisions in verse 6 as we see secondly in our message the character displayed by her godly decisions. First of all, her decision to return to the land. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the land of Moab. She was never supposed to live in Moab. You know, not everybody moved to Moab when the famine came. We see this when she returned, right? There are people there greeting her. Why? They didn't all leave. Some trusted God through the famine. Some stayed in Israel because God never wanted his people to trust in other nations and go to heathen places. He wanted them to trust him. Well, her husband hadn't done that, and her husband led her and her sons to Moab, but now she's returning. And yes, I know it says that she heard that God had visited his people and giving them food. But you know, moving is never easy. It would have been very easy for her to justify just staying in Moab, where her daughters would have been able to marry Moabite men and, and, and they could have had a future, but she knows that that's not where she's supposed to be. And then we see her selfless desire for her daughters-in-law in verse 7 through 13. We won't reread the verses, but she's, she's clearly concerned about their future and she knows that if they go to Israel, that humanly speaking, they won't have a future. An Israelite man is not going to marry a Moabite woman under normal circumstances. They, they, they weren't supposed to. And so she strongly, she begs with them actually to stay in Moab. That they had no obligation. She didn't want them to feel any obligation to stay with her because she knew that their future, humanly speaking, would not be good. Notice as she talks to them about this, notice her appreciation of their love and loyalty in verse 8. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead, that would be their husbands, her sons, and with me. And notice also the prayer of blessing that she gives regarding their future in verse 9. May the Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband, then she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. In other words, she wanted what was best for them. 
And in her mind, staying in Moab, not being able to foresee the incredible, almost miraculous things that God would do for her in providing for her and providing ultimately for Ruth. She couldn't have foreseen that. She knew that they could not expect under the covenant of God to, to see those kinds of things happen in their lives. And so she truly believes that for them, staying in Moab would be what's best. She has no real hope for her own future, but she wants them to have a future. And so she encourages them in the way that she thought was best. Uh, forgetting what's going to happen, because I think we need to keep ourselves in the moment for this point to make sense. We need to understand the selfless nature of this. All moms are selfless. All good moms, I should say, are selfless. Because from the moment their first child is born, their energy, their time is no longer their own, but it's consumed by watching over and taking care of those children until they're grown, until they're out of the house. And even then, uh, the pull that happens in a mother's heart for her children as she sees them having needs and see them going through trials. Well, that leads us to the third point this morning, and that's the culmination and consequence of her godly wisdom and triumphant faith. God took these little small steps of faith, returning to the land, being selfless, by rewarding her with a daughter-in-law, the one of whom this book bears its name, Ruth, to return with her. And from that, for God to do things that neither one of them could have anticipated. And I knew that I wouldn't have the time in this message to walk through this entire book, but in order for us to appreciate this point, we need to turn to the end of the story. I'm trusting that most of you know the details of how we get to this point, but if you don't, I encourage you to read the rest of this book. It's only uh, four chapters long, but we're going to go to the end of the story in chapter 4, verse 10 through 22. Remember what Naomi had said to Ruth as she begged and pleaded with Ruth to not follow through with this decision that Mo Ruth was making to stay with Naomi. She said, you'd have no future with me. You'll have no husband. How, how am I going to raise, uh, how am I going to have another son through whom you could have um, a name with, a future with, an inheritance. Chapter 4, verse 10 says, Moreover, this is Boaz speaking. And again, we're, we're covering a lot of territory. There's a huge gap here that I'm trusting you understand. But to fill in just a little bit, God brings along Boaz, who is a relative of Naomi's through Naomi's husband. In the Old Testament laws of the Leverite marriage, the... If a person is a widow, a, a widow is left without a, uh, without any children and without um, anyone to carry on her husband's name. The Old Testament law provided the opportunity for a close relative to marry, in this case, to marry Ruth. And through that, their son, their heir would actually carry on Naomi's husband's name. It was a way to provide for widows. And so Boaz is, as we get to chapter 4, Boaz has, has come to know Ruth by Ruth gleaning in his fields. She, he's come to take an interest in her. And he decides to become this uh, kinsman redeemer, as the scripture calls it, and redeem uh, Naomi's husband's land and, and provide for Naomi by marrying Ruth. And so that's where we're picking up the story here in verse 10 of chapter 4. Moreover, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Milan, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be cut off from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. And you are witnesses today. All the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth in Ephrathah and become famous in Bethlehem. 
Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the offspring which the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, now notice they're saying this to Naomi, because of this whole kinsman redeemer, this son would actually be considered by Israelite law a son of Naomi's. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed, and he is the father of Jesse and the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. To Perez was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. And to Ram, Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nashon. And to Nashon, Salmon. And to Salmon was born Boaz. And to Boaz, Obed. And to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse was born David. And of course, as the generations to continue, Jesus Christ was born of the family of David. A woman who started out quickly becoming a widow, living in a foreign land with no hope for a future. God, through his powerful grace, sent along a godly Israelite man named Boaz to recognize the godliness of Ruth who had made the commitment when she went, when she decided to go back to Israel with Naomi, she said, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Yes, ethnic-wise, she was a Moabite, but she became a spiritual Israelite. She converted to the God of Israel, and God in his grace and his mercy took all of this, what seemed like an impossibly terrible situation, and turned it into a blessing that neither Naomi or Ruth could have ever imagined. Naomi, who says, I come back empty, and the Lord has dealt bitter, bitterly with me in the end of chapter 1, now has the women of the town praising her and, and talking about, her being prosperous and her house being as prosperous as Rachel and Leah, who, of course, gave birth to the, uh, to the 12 men who would become the 12 tribes that would make up the nation of Israel. There's many things we've covered, and there's much more that we could, we could say, but for today's message, we simply want to say this. A godly mother responds to the challenges of life with godly wisdom and triumphant faith. Here's a woman who lost her husband. She lost her sons. She had no one but Ruth, a Moabite daughter-in-law. She thought she had no future. But God did for her amazingly abundantly beyond all that she could ask or think because she took baby steps of faith and she trusted God and she went back to her land. And God used that decision and used many others following that to take her from being in a very negative situation to becoming a wonderful example of a selfless mother who God blessed greatly. Moms and moms-to-be, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you want to be remembered for? Do you want to be remembered for being a great doctor or being a great lawyer or even being a great Christian school teacher? Not that you can't be those things. But there's no greater legacy than being a godly mom. Being faithful to the Lord. And raising godly children. Maybe God wants you to do both. But don't sacrifice being a godly wife and a godly mother. Unless God has called you to singleness. Or God has called you to not have children and not given you that. But don't trade that. Don't trade any other kind of aspiration 
for being a godly mother. And don't allow the difficulties of this day and age that we live in, the difficulties of the, the immorality of our society, and even the difficulties of what we're going through today, keep you from being a godly mom. Don't rationalize or justify a life of compromise because there's hardship that's come into your life. There's hardship that comes into everyone's life. What really matters is how we respond to it. I know this is probably a very different Mother's Day message than most, but I think it's a very important look at a godly woman who had all kinds of challenges and yet through them shows us that though things may not start off well, it's how we finish that counts in life. And I challenge you and encourage you that no matter where you've been, no matter what your life has been like in the past, you can be a godly mother. Men that are listening and children that are listening, you can be godly for men, husbands, fathers, single men, children. You can be and you need to strive to be godly children. What a wonderful gift to your mother to simply grow in the the knowledge and the love of God. Ruth was, as the women praised here in chapter 4, she was a much greater gift to Naomi than if Naomi had had ten sons. And that's quite a statement in the context of Israel and how they valued sons and what that mean, meant to inheritance and so forth. So women, as you celebrate today a very different kind of Mother's Day, remember this. A godly mother responds to the challenges of life with godly wisdom and a triumphant faith. Oh, Heavenly Father, whether we're a mother today or a husband, whether we're a single man or single woman, whether we're a young or old person, may each one of us live out that lesson. May each one of us strive to be godly in your sight by responding in faith to the challenges of life by seeking and living out your wisdom, not our own. And Lord, bless our moms. Thank, thank you for them. I thank you for mine, and I thank you for these ladies in our church, and I thank you for all that might be listening to this message. Lord, help them to recognize that being a godly mother holds second place to nothing when it comes to how we live our lives. And Lord, we'll give you all the honor and praise for what you do today through this message from your word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.